And good morning. I want to thank the worship team for leading us this morning in those uh, worship songs and the thought that they put in behind the choosing them. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much, worship team. I want to take some time uh, this morning and we're going to explore uh, the second gift that was given to Jesus um, by the Magi. And, but before we do, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for being able to gather together, whether it's here or at home. Uh, Lord, that we can come together, we can worship you, we can worship you and uh, just praise you for who you are. And Lord, we thank you that you are Lord of our life and that we can come and we can explore that more together and that as a body we can grow closer to you. And so, Lord, as we look into your word right now, as we look into um, the gift of frankincense and what that meant, uh, Lord, uh, we just pray that you would bless us and, uh, yeah, that we would have a better understanding of that as we leave here this morning. And so, Lord, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to explore. We pray this in your name. Amen. How many of you at Christmas time set up a nativity scene? Yeah, a bunch of you, excellent. Uh, I remember as I was growing up, um, one of the things that my mom always loved to do was set up her nativity scene. And uh, when I was a teenager, I built um, the house, or um, I can't remember the exact word, but yeah, I built this house for it. And, um, she would set it up every year. If you were to come over to our place, you would see a nativity scene, a nativity scene is set up all year round. Uh, we don't take it down, we leave it up. And it's a great reminder um, of uh, Christmas, but also of the gift of Jesus and uh, whatnot. But as you look at that, you set up the shepherds and they're kind of close to baby Jesus, right? And they're looking over at the crib and looking down at him. And you've got the wise men sitting off to the side, generally holding a gift as they present it to uh, Jesus. And there's uh, an opportunity for us to ponder on these different aspects. And, uh, you know, as we've been going through, we've been reminded that the shepherds probably didn't see the wise men. But they both got to experience Jesus. They got, both got to worship him and both got to have that uh, time with him. And it was an important time. And so as we look at uh, the wise men today, especially the second one, I want us to ponder more of what that gift was and how uh, important it was. And so I want to read Matthew 2, uh, where the wise men uh, came in. And it says this, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow, uh, Matthew 2, verse 1. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king, the king of the Jews? We saw the star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone else in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law, and he asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for that is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not least among the ruling cities of Judea, for a ruler will come from you who has been the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time that the star had first appeared. And he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me, so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went on their way. And the star uh, they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house, and they saw the child and his mother, Mary. And they bowed and worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another road. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Last week we looked at one of the gifts that was brought. And we want to explore all three gifts. Um, and so when we looked last week, we talked about gold. 
and the gift that it was and how it was presented to a king. And we all can understand gold and the value behind it. But when we look at the gift of frankincense, it's a little bit different. This morning, as you were coming in, I don't know if you guys noticed there might have been a different aroma as you came up the stairs. I put frankincense out. And so it's, I didn't put a whole lot because it can be an overpowering fragrance, but it is there if you want to smell it on the way out as well. And frankincense is one of those strange ones where, you know, we kind of wonder, you know, or at least jokingly, I wonder, you know, did the wise man just go to his medicine cabinet and grab something? This looks valuable, I'll give it to, you know, Jesus. Um, but it's not a common thing here in North America. If we go over to the Middle East, it is more common there. Um, and this would have been something that was very common in that area. Uh, when you look throughout the Bible, frankincense is mentioned 22 times throughout the entire Bible. It's an aromatic resin that comes from um, a Boswella, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, tree, which still grows um, in Yemen and Somalia and Ethiopia. And the sap of the tree is dried and burned as an incense. Um, and had, uh, it also had, or is said to have, several medicinal properties. Uh, I remember reading in my research as I was uh, preparing for this morning that one of the treatments back then for leprosy was frankincense. And so, um, you know, but not everyone could afford that, uh, that had that ailment. And so, for those that could afford it, that was one of the treatments that they would get. So here we have the second wise man or Magi's gift to Jesus. Um, and it came to stand in contrast with uh, what the Jews had known. Because frankincense is also thought as a gift that you present to a priest. It was an incense that would be used in the temple and the priest would bring it and use it. This wise man breaks down decades, um, decades of long separation between king and priest. Jesus was just declared king by the gift of gold, and now he's being declared a priest by the gift of frankincense. Jesus would fill this role. He could fill both roles, but that was kind of unheard of back then. This gift separates Jesus as different, as unique, and as special. And I'm thankful that Jesus is my king, because I need a king. I need him and his rule in my life. I need his reign, his authority. However, I'm also equally thankful that he is also a priest. Paul jumps on this idea in Hebrews 4, when he writes this, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, who holds us firmly to what we believe, the high priest is, of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us boldly, um, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy. We will find his grace to help us when we need it most. These were the words from Paul. Jesus is the great high priest. He is our ready access to God. Jesus knows and experiences everything that we do. We don't have a priest that is out of touch with reality. He's been there through weakness, through testing, he has experienced it all, all but sin. Paul reminds us of that too in that verse. So let us remember that we can go to him at any time, always ready. And he is there for us. He is there to help us and to guide us during this time. Jesus' kingship is important. However, his role of priest is something that we cannot take for granted either. We need a priest. As a priest, he re represents on our behalf. In Jesus' time, the priest was, had two responsibilities. The first responsibility was they represented God to the people. 
They spoke for God to the people, and they showed the people what God was like. Secondly, they represented the people to God. The people could not approach God beyond a certain point. They needed a representative to go on their behalf into the veil, into the very presence of God. If you remember back in Luke 2, we meet Zechariah, the priest, who was performing these duties. It says this, starting in verse 8, One day Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom, the priest was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. This isn't an uncommon thing that we experience as we read through the Bible, the priest doing this. When Jesus was born, he had the same uh, two tasks of his divine mandate. He was to be fully God and fully man. He was equal parts of both. And that's important for us to remember because he was able to equally represent both sides. He brings us together. He builds bridges between us and God. And there's no conflict there. He can represent both sides equally. John 14, 9 says this, For I have been with you all the time, Philip, yet you don't know who I am. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? He represents both God and man. He represents us before God as well. He represents our weakness, our failures, and our need for the Father. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is no one, uh, no one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. Sorry, there, let me restart that. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Jesus Christ. I am thankful that we have someone who can show us God. Jesus revealed this through his goodness, his faithfulness, and his mercy, and he showed us the love of God. I'm thankful that Jesus is the priest that could re represent us to God. And Jesus represents his holiness as a shield from God's wrath. He is our protector. He is our high priest. But as he does this, we have to remember that he understands us completely. We don't have a priest that is out of touch with reality. He's been through it all, through weakness, through testing, he's experienced it all, all but sin. For we have a high priest who was tempted and yet was able to stand against those temptations, was able to live without sin. If it was not for Jesus being born as a baby, God in flesh, we could not be able to relate to God. How can we, as weak and as um, understanding as we are, understand the limitlessness of God, the awesomeness of God without this? We can try to. We have theories. We have questions. But sometimes some things are just out of reach for us to understand. Jesus understands our questions. He understands our weakness. He knows what it's like to feel those enduring tests. He knows what we go through. He knows what it's like to be hated, to be ridiculed, to be doubted, to be interrupted, angry, sad, emotional. He knows what it feels like to go through conflict. He knows what it's like to experience pain. There are times where 
I want to look up and ask him, do you understand? Do you understand what I'm going through? Sometimes, to me, God can seem far away, removed, distant. Yet as a high priest, he is not. He's understanding and gives empathy. My empathy may be limited. My comprehension is limited. But Jesus, when he came, was not. He was tried, tested, and proven. He fully understands. Jesus is not limited in his understanding. He understands each one of us fully. And when he does that, he prays for us. I love the invitation that we get from Hebrews 4, 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy. And when we find his grace to help us when we need it most. We all need that. We all need to approach the throne. Come to God. And we can. And he'll be there helping us. Romans 8, 34 says this. Then who will condemn us? No one. Jesus Christ died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. He is there on our behalf, advocating for each one of us. He prays for us. Jesus himself lives for the purpose of praying and for being there for each one of us. And that was exemplified in his ministry and life where we see him going off many times to pray, to spend that time with his Heavenly Father searching for direction, searching for where you should go, praying for others on their behalf. Romans 8.35 continues on with a huge blessing that each one of us can claim. It says this, nothing can separate us from Christ's love. Nothing can separate us from It does not mean, uh, does it mean he no longer loves us when we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger, threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day and we are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the fears of today nor our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm thankful that Jesus prays on my behalf. I'm thankful that he prays on your behalf as well. That he is praying for each one of us. Jesus is praying for you. You have the Son of God himself sitting next to God, praying, interceding and petitioning for your needs, for you. This wise man approached Jesus as a priest. We should go one step further and approach Jesus as the high priest. He is our representative. He understands us and he is praying for us. Today I want to challenge you as you approach Jesus, as you approach him as the priest, as we come into our time of communion, what do you need from him right now? 
Do you need healing? Do you need prayer? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need a connection? What do you need from our High Priest Jesus today? If you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, remember, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons. Neither our fears or our worries. The powers of hell cannot separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from that love. I want to take some time today and to pray for these things as we continue to seek Jesus as we enter into a time of communion and remembrance. To seek Jesus as our High Priest. I want to give you guys an opportunity to pray as I come down and as we will share the elements. But take some time and pray for those things that you need this morning. Let Jesus fill you. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that as we come before you, we, can, we too can declare you as high priest in our life. Lord, I thank you for the wisdom that you gave each one of those wise men, how they were able to present and prepare the way even before you stepped into them. As a child, you were able to go forward knowing these things and experiencing these things just as we have. Lord, I'm thankful that you sent Jesus for each one of us. That he is our high priest. Lord, I know there's times where I complain and there's things that I do that I shouldn't. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness for that this morning. Lord, I'm thankful that you've created this way and that nothing can separate us from you. That that love is always there, strong. And Lord, I'm thankful that we can come together as a body and we can share and remember through communion what you did for each one of us. taking that burden upon yourself for each one of us, that we might have life, that we might have life with you. So Lord, fill us with our needs right now. Be there for each one of us. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to take some time and go over the passage concerning Jesus' instructions as he was meeting with his disciples on that night where they shared communion. Matthew 26 says this, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread, 
that I have here. And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave pieces to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine, and he said to them, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. And it is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my will with words, I will not drink of wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So I want to take and I want to remember. We can take the bread. We just wanted to prepare that. Jesus' instructions were take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat. And then he took the cup and said the same thing. Take and drink. This is my body or my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give thanks for the gift of life for the gift of joy and love, for the gift of comfort when we do not or cannot feel that joy, for the gift of healing and for mercy, for the gift of patience and serenity, for the gift of hope. Jesus, we know that your presence changes the world. It's changed our lives. So we pray that you might be indeed born in us again. That the whole world will be reshaped and reborn as your kingdom emerges and surrounds us. May your spirit stir within us and cause us to long for that day when heaven and earth will be back together. Lord, we thank you for this time where we can come together and we can share this. We thank you for the promises that you give us in your word and the faithfulness and the, just the presence of that. Lord, be with us now. Continue to be there for each one of us as we continue along. And no matter what our struggles are, Lord, we thank you that you are with us every step of the way. Fill us now. We pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat>